charts are, are no way an accurate, uh, an accurate guide to what's selling. Actually, uh, they are a joke. Actually, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about that. They're definitely a joke, and it's, it's certainly not, the, not the general public that make up the charts. It's the record companies, and it's, it's who is giving away more and who is giving the dealers more incentive, um, who will be successful in the, in the singles chart. <laughs> In the past year, some major British record companies have manipulated the pop charts. They've helped stars like Fleetwood Mac, The Pretenders, Gary Newman and others into the charts by giving free gifts to record stores. Tonight, Weldon Action investigates the chart busters. Tuesday morning at the London offices of the British Market Research Bureau. They're an independent company who compile Britain's weekly bestsellers charts for the record industry and the BBC. Two, three, Leo Sayer. Three, eight, Diana Ross. They use a special panel of 450 record dealers who fill in chart return diaries like this with ticks each time they sell a single or an LP. What happens on, on a Tuesday morning is that we, we have a preliminary chart and then we check through with shops outside the panel to make sure that the pattern of sales we see in the charts are the same outside panel shops. So we have a sort of quality check going on. Sue Bradley is an associate director of the British Market Research Bureau, the BMRB. We've had all the sales diaries in from all over the country. They come down on the Saturday, late Saturday. So you're adding up the records that have actually been sold? We do, in... we do some manual adding up, but a lot of it is done on the computer. And we're just getting the chart together that's going to go out on the radio. But right now, here it is. This is the top 40, as compiled for the BBC by the British Market Research Bureau. This week, six new entries, 19 go down, 13 go up, and there are two non-movers. But here we go, then. How secret is this process supposed to be? It's as confidential as we can make it. It's, it's necessary for it to be confidential. And what steps do you take to keep it confidential and secret? We have a code of conduct which is signed by all the dealers who take part in the survey, um, whereby they agree not to divulge any information to any third party whatsoever. The dealers vouch that the information that they put in their diaries to you is accurate. That's correct. That's correct. Getting into the BMRB's national chart is vital to a record company's survival. This pressure has caused some of them to manipulate the charts by an illegal practice called record hyping. Hyping means getting some record dealers on the supposedly secret BMRB panel to put a falsely high number of sales ticks in their chart return diaries for specific records. If enough diaries are falsified, a record can chart, though its genuine sales may be low. Jack Hutton is managing director of Music Week magazine, which publishes the BMRB chart. I think it's uh, the most important chart in Britain by a long, long way. And it's, uh, it's the only chart worth uh, hyping, if you'll pardon me for saying that, because it's the only chart that's broadcast by Top of the Pops and BBC Radio 1. So it's nationwide chart. It's the important chart. And so that's why it gets so much attention. But, of course, you wouldn't approve of hyping. In no way would I approve of hyping. Record industry analyst Godfrey Rust explains why it's vital to enter the charts. It's the single most important piece of promotion that any record can get. Um, the main reason is not so much that it appears on the chart, but that it influences all the key people who are the radio programmers, the producers of shows like Top of the Pops, and the important record dealers and the wholesalers, the ones who put in very large orders for a record once they see it going into the chart, maybe five, ten thousand copies at a time. Um, the most important sales day will be a Tuesday afternoon when the, after the BMRB chart has been released. A record that takes a big climb may get ten, twenty, thirty thousand sales directly off the back of its chart placing. It's where the records start to make a lot of money. That's right, yeah. Two years ago, the Daily Mirror showed how record companies first tried hyping the charts using housewives to buy up certain records to create artificial popularity. The record company's trade association, the British Phonographic Industry, warned that hyping broke the Trades Descriptions Act and the Theft Act. The BPI's Code of Conduct, published this year, forbids inducements to chart return shops to falsify their sales figures. John Deacon is the Director General of the BPI, the industry's trade association and watchdog. He explains why the code was introduced. We wanted to make the charts secure against unprincipled methods, 
There was a very good reason. We felt that a strong chart creates a strong industry. And I think in the circumstances, it has done well. Despite the code, chart hyping didn't stop. Brian Bates, managing director of the British Market Research Bureau, gets reports of attempts to manipulate the charts his company compiles. I have no evidence that this is the policy of any record company deliberately to set out to uh, influence the sales of a record. That is not to say that some representative of that company or a company may not from time to time out in the field take some action which would infringe that code. Until June, Avis Lingard worked in the Midlands as a sales promotions representative for WEA, one of Britain's largest record companies and part of the giant American Warner Communications company. Hyping um, involves visiting chart return shops and asking for favours. And when I say favours, I mean asking the dealer to actually write down uh, or put down ticks or numbers um, and actual, actually falsify the diary, really, or falsify the amount of sales that, that, that was in that diary or that he'd made during the week. If that was done efficiently by each rep out on the road, it was quite possible that a record would enter the top 75. And the more you did it, the higher it would go? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now, what did the dealer get in return for falsifying his sales diary? Well, he got a variety of things. I mean, the, the, the main thing that he would get were, were free product, were albums. Um, possibly sort of five or perhaps even more, depending on how important the, uh, the project was. The usual amount was between three and five, worth, I suppose, at retail volume, about £25 or so. And he could sell those through his shop? <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And that's pure profit? Oh, pure profit, yeah. The usual amount, or, or uh, let's say that the chart return shop could expect to make during a year, um, was approximately, it's very much an approximation, but we'll say about £10,000 a year that they could expect to pull off, off other companies as well, um, besides not just the company I work for, but other companies as well. And do you think that the record companies pay special attention to those chart return shops with your diaries in them? Uh, not as far as I know. I know that from time to time allegations are made that they do this, uh, and uh, we are constantly investigating any such allegations that we receive. Um, but uh, on the whole, no, I don't think they do. Until last Christmas, Ian Mallett was also a sales promotions representative for WEA, covering Merseyside and Manchester. Well, we were sent a list of all the shops to call on. Uh, this was the latest list I received, and uh, it also lists all the chart return shops, which are marked CR alongside. And uh, The chart return shops were marked with, a, with the initial CR? Yeah, yeah. And where did that list come from? Uh, this was, came from head office. Of WEA? That's right, yeah. In London? Yeah. Every Tuesday, after the BBC first broadcast the new BMRB pop chart, Mallet had to telephone the woman who ran his sales team. I was given two specific records to really put a lot of effort in. And there was no doubt in your mind that uh, what she meant was that she wanted those records hyped? Oh, yes, yeah. False ticks in the diary? Yeah, no doubt about it. Last November, Mallet recorded a bad-tempered sales team meeting when his boss demanded... Why the f are we not getting chart entries? I don't want excuses. I want reasons, real reasons. We are losing out. Quite frankly, we're being out-hyped. It's as simple as that. There are people who do it themselves who've, who've got such a good relationship with the chart return dealers that um, I think the practice is to pick up the diary from the front of the shop, walk out to the office at the back or something, and just sit down and, and write out what you want to, you know, whatever number you're working on, or or whatever tick you're going to put down, you know. They just fill the diary up themselves. Basically, uh, I just asked for the book, took it into the back of the shop and uh, put in appropriate ticks here and there. And really, it was just a case of uh, saying, here's your free album, where's the diary? The Pretenders, one of Britain's best new rock bands, were signed up to W. <laughs> Last November, WEA's head office sent a memo to sales staff saying, On Friday 9th of November, we will release two very important singles, Lurkers, New Guitar in Town, Pretenders, Brass in Pocket. The Pretenders are a major development act for WEA. I want to see both these singles in the Music Week chart on Tuesday. You know what you have to do to achieve this, so please make sure the appropriate action is taken. The following week, both songs duly appeared in the charts. Pretenders 
were very, very important to us. They were a good band, and they'd had two previous singles, which hadn't been as big a hits as WA expected, so Brass in Pocket did start to sell slowly, and it needed that extra little bit of push behind it to get it to the position it was in. Also, there was a, uh, an album sort of expected, so with a hit single, uh, a number one single preferably, the album would just fly out. The Pretender's single and album got number one positions, as WEA announced in this advert. The Pretenders, like all bands in this programme, were unaware their records had been hyped. Andy Ferguson, a former WEA promotions man, now manages another highly successful WEA band, The Undertones. Most of the Undertones singles have been priority records for the company. My knowledge of the music business in the past few years would indicate to me that that means that uh, something more than just the ordinary sell of records is being uh, is influencing the entry of the charts. By hyping, you accept that your record is given false ticks in the sales diaries. Yeah. Now you used to work for WEA. Yeah. Uh, would that practice uh, surprise you if it had happened to the, the Undertones records? No. <laughs> Why do record companies do it? Because in the short term, it gives them a profitable turnover. Um, record companies these days are looking for a quick turnover. It's not like the late 60s where they would give a band three, four years and maybe three or four albums to break into the charts. They want it to happen overnight now. And if uh, it doesn't happen with one band, there's another 10 on the street that they can sign up and try and maneuver into that position. It seems to be a very cynical way of looking at it. It's a very cynical business. I well remember going down to head office in Wembley uh, a year last spring. I walked into an executive's office there and actually saw four diaries being compiled by this executive in the office of the company. Uh, obviously four diaries which came from a shop or a group of shops. And uh, he was obviously fitting in the diaries uh, for our benefit, uh, but also fitting in other companies' sales um, to make it look realistic. Probably not reflecting the other companies' sales in the true light. WEA's senior executives met here in the company's Soho offices every Tuesday after the pop chart was announced. They selected their new priority releases and sent out written promotion plans to their sales team. World in Action learned that the phrase doing a number was often used at these meetings and was understood by our sources to mean that salesmen should get as many diary ticks as possible for certain priority records. Other major companies held similar Tuesday chart meetings. Until earlier this month, Colin Byrne was a general manager with EMI Records and used to attend Tuesday chart meetings with other senior staff. Mr Byrne was to have disclosed to World in Action what happened at these meetings. But on Saturday, EMI's president, Mr. Ken East, wrote to him warning him of possible legal action if he talked. Mr. Byrne's disclosures about EMI's Tuesday meetings might break a confidentiality clause in his contract with the company, so were unable to transmit his interview. Steve Hopkins was an assistant manager in a big London record store until February. He witnessed many attempts to hype records and manipulate the charts. Major companies had reps who'd come in uh, between once and perhaps every day of the week and they'd try and push their records and ask you to tick, tick the diary. Tick the diary? Yeah. So they were trying to hype records? Sure, they'd come in for the, uh, the main directive was to get their LPs into the charts or singles into the charts and uh, they'd convince you that this single was meant to get into the charts and they'd offer things in order to make you tick the diary or try and get the diary themselves sometimes if they could get hold of it. They tried to get the diary themselves? Yeah, sure. They'd, sometimes they'd have the cheek to sort of actually, you know, try and grab the diary and tick it or ask to borrow it or whatever. And if they could get it, they would. Did you ever see any of them actually successfully grabbing the diary? There were a couple of the reps who were sort of uh, ridiculous enough to try and grab it. There was uh, WAA, United Artists and uh, a resident a &M rep to try and get hold of as much as possible and they used to take their LPs down for singles but things like big things like the police and uh, Queen, Eagles, Fleetwood Mac, things like that. 
World in Action spoke to these companies. A&M denied the allegation. WEA, United Artists and EMI wouldn't comment. This chart return shop owner won't be identified because publicity would cost him his place on the BMRB panel. Every day at some stage somebody does in that and asks us to do something which is false. What do the company salesmen offer you in return for false ticks? Uh, normally it's free records. Sometimes it may be sweatshirts, t-shirts, badges, and occasionally it has been bottles of drink. This is on a daily basis? Not on a daily basis, but almost certainly on a weekly basis. And what is the value of those free gifts on a weekly basis? Could be anywhere up to £100 a week, possibly more. Did they ever persuade you to take the diary? Uh, a couple of times I just do it just to get rid of them, <laughs> just to get them off my back. Because they're just so pushy, and they're just so aggressive. They come in and push you and push you until you just say, OK, I'll do this, and then you pretend to do it and just get rid of them, if you could. Or you just do it in front of their faces just to make sure they wouldn't come back for a little while. World in Action asked John Deacon, as the watchdog of the record industry, if the BPI was aware of widespread chart hyping. When you say hyping, it depends what you're talking about. Really. Falsification of the diary in return for free gifts. Uh, certainly on the information we have received, no. It's not. No. World in Action asked Mr Bates of the British Market Research Bureau if he knew that record representatives tried to manipulate his chart. Allegations have been made, and indeed, as I say, we have... Uh, checks that we carry out on the way in which the charts are compiled and we reserve the right to delete a record from the chart if we think that some attempt has been made to influence the sales return. Quite recently we, we had uh, a group called the Expressos which was probably the, the biggest the, the biggest push that I've ever seen WA go into on a single. Um, the pressure on that one was absolutely phenomenal and we did actually get it in there. Uh, phoned up for the charts on Tuesday morning the Expressos was in, there was much rejoicing in WEA and by three o'clock in the afternoon, the Expressos was no longer in. And why, why was that? It had been dropped out of the charts. Only a few weeks ago, you took a group called the Expressos that had appeared in the charts and you removed it. Well, I'm afraid I can't comment on any individual record that's been removed. We were put under even more pressure to get that record back into the charts again. And it was a matter of honour, you know, I mean, it had to go back in again or else it looked ridiculous. You re it back in? Yeah. <laughs> It actually got back in, yeah. Every week we used to receive um, <coughs> a document called Competitors' Activities, which listed uh, basically company per company which albums or singles they were working on and basically uh, what they were giving away. And where would this document come from? From the head office. World in Action saw some of these memos prepared by WEA and sent their representative to keep them up to date with what rival salesmen were doing. The contents of some are confirmed by our investigation. CBS pushing Charlie Daniels and the Nolan sisters singles and giving away Earth, Wind and Fire albums for favours. United Artists giving to dealers a typed list of product they'd like helped into the charts, underlining heavy priorities. Phonogram are giving away scotch and satin jackets for favours on Dusty Springfield, Judy Zook and Van Morrison singles. A&M giving away white wine for help on the police album. With the cooperation of certain open-minded dealers, ticks are being given on the new Elkie Brooks single every time a police single is sold. World in Action approached these companies. A&M denied the allegation. CBS, United Artists and Phonogram wouldn't comment. Ian McNay runs a small independent record company. As a member of the trade association, the BPI, recently spoke out against chart hyping. Well, I, I feel very strongly for a very practical reason at the moment. I have a record out by an American band which has sold 25,000 singles in five weeks, which is an average of about 1,000 copies a day. Now, that should be enough to get into the chart. But because the lower end of the chart is clogged up with hype records, I'm not in that chart. I know there's records in that chart which have sold less than half of mine. And I think this is wrong because my sales are genuine. They're selling, they're selling to a cross-section cross of record buyers. And the chart should reflect genuine record sales every week, not hyped records that the major record companies choose to work, which it seems to do a lot of the time. Well, what records have you helped hype into the charts in the last 12 months? Well, we've actually got some charts here. Um, the, there's some prime examples. There's uh, 
There's Bang Bang, B.A. Robertson, the new Amsterdam single from the Elvis Costello. Um, Fleetwood Mac and Tusk. Very, very important that single sold, mainly because we had an album out um, by Fleetwood Mac, and it was vital that al the album uh, reached number one. So Tusk was pretty well um, hyped. Classic one in here is Luton Airport by Catch UK. That was a perfect example. Nobody had ever heard it, but because it, it did enter the charts, there was a Top of the Pops on it, and it did start to sell then. On this, on this particular chart here, here, you've got Cars, Gary Newman, which we hyped up. If I Said You Had a Beautiful Body by the Bellamy Brothers, which we hyped up. And Love's Got a Hold of Me, which we hyped up. So that effectively is three of the top four singles, which is an amazing prestige position for WEA to be in. John Fruin is managing director of WEA, the firm which employed sales representatives like Avis Lingard and Ian Mallett. Fruin's five-year contract is worth over a quarter of a million pounds, and he's got an international reputation for aggressive marketing. The man who runs WEA's sales promotion team is Mike Heap, himself a former salesman and member of the BPI committee which outlawed chart hyping. Mr Heap arranged a licensing and distribution deal between WEA and a smaller company, Lightning Records Limited. Lightning's grateful directors gave Mr. Heap a present of a few shares in a small music publishing company they owned. Backed by WEA's promotion department, Lightning's labels, Gallery and Scope, enjoyed some successes as this chart return shop owner remembers. A notable one that actually took place last Christmas, uh, It's My House by a group called Storm. There were in fact two versions of the same record around at the same time, the other one being by Diana Ross. Heap told his salesman, it will be extremely prestigious for WEA to beat the Diana Ross version, and it'll mean they won't sell so many of the Diana Ross TV album. Let's see some action. It really did become silly. In fact, we used to joke about it because it in fact became the battle of the hypers, because not only was WEA really hammering away with their one, EMI, who handled the Diana Ross version, were also doing the same. Uh, there was a record by a group called Shy, uh, that was on a label called Gallery. It absolutely nothing got in the chart. This was hype? Oh, ultimately it was, I think in my mind, it's one of the worst examples I can remember. We were played by the WA rep who kept on asking us to, you know, stop this record. We'd received a few copies for nothing. We hadn't been asked for it. We hadn't sold a copy. It then charted. Shortly before Shy's record charted last April, Dealers nationally had only ordered 82 copies from WEA headquarters. WEA heavily promoted My Tune by the Cool Notes. Almost 9,000 free promotional copies of it were produced. It too charted. Mr. Fruin's associates at Lightning Records, managing director Raymond Laren and his partner Norman Mandel, declined to discuss on film their licensing deal with WEA, which brought them eight chart successes from 13 releases by little-known artists. Nor would their associate, Mike Heap, WEA's sales and promotions general manager, explain why almost 65,000 free records were available to promote these 13 releases. World in Action asked John Deacon how the BPI, as the trade's watchdog, could stamp out chart hyping when some of its own membership were doing it. I repeat, on the information that we have received, then there is no hyping, widespread hyping, do you think that you're likely to get that information as long as the people who make up your organization are the companies who are doing the hyping? I may, our organization, our membership, is made up of 100 members covering large companies and small companies. Who sit in judgment on themselves? Indeed, they do. Well, Why what, should they not? What sort of a policing operation is that? Why should they not? Well, because if they uh, sit in judgment on themselves, it is likely that you will never get any evidence of hyping from them. No, I don't accept that at all. I don't accept that at all. And I'm, let, let me just make a point, which I've gone on record on saying in the past, and I will repeat it. If there is any Im important evidence of hyping, and I'm talking now about the serious kind we've been talking about, then undoubtedly I would be very prepared to bring it to the attention of the police, or the Director of Public Prosecution. We invited WEA's Managing Director, John Fruin, onto this programme. We wanted to discuss allegations of chart hyping made by his company's former employees. He declined, but told us... I think it is morally wrong for a record to be shown at a chart position which is not an accurate reflection of its sales. 
For this reason, I have been a strong supporter of the BPI Code of Conduct. In June, Mr. Froen was unanimously elected chairman of the watchdog BPI. His job? To maintain the highest standards of the industry.